you want to do this. Oh, okay. <laughs> there we go. Uh, hang on. Let me, I'll restart this. Uh, let me go again and then restart. Okay, so, yeah, now it says uh, live. Hey, everybody. I'm How's just it going? So, oh, yeah, there we go. It has come up. Yep. I Beautiful. don't see myself, but is, if you guys see it, then good. Hey, yep, David, been, how are you doing? I can see you. How are you, Aaron? I'm doing good. How are you doing? Really great, actually. I've had a uh, big week. Uh, excited about today's show. Just posted a video this morning, actually, for a Vanguard um, tripod that I reviewed. Oh, I love that little thing. You'll have to watch, Aaron. It's I know. such a great little tripod. I seen that. I watched your other video that we're going to be talking about here, and uh, I saw that come up, but didn't have time to see it. And so, very interested to watch that. What sort of tripods do you use, Aaron? I use. Um, where is it? Oh, look, I'm wireless, so I can go this way. You can go. <laughs> yeah. So, if you haven't checked that out this morning, uh, have a look. I did post it. Um, I was given a Vanguard one. Well, I wasn't given it. Was just to, to loan. But you can see now. I'll cross to Aaron. He can explain what he uses. Well, for traveling, I use the Mi Photo, this little guy here. It's really nice. It has the Arca Swiss, so I actually use I use this on my my Fuji film. It's like a little uh, grip, extended grip, which has Arca Swiss, uh, you know, like bottom to it, kind of like you know L brackets yeah. and all that. So I can switch on and off really good. I also use the Peak Design capture clip, which is also Arca Swiss. But when I'm doing video productions or more, I need something more sturdy, I'm using the uh, Manfrotto. It's an old Manfrotto. I mean, that thing's probably like maybe 14 years old, and it still works like brand new. Yeah, well, wait till you see this one because um, I was really surprised because I've got the Mi Photo one as well. I've, I've got that because I like the way the legs fold up. But this one was just ridiculously light, and it's sort of like a mixture between a, a video tripod and also a um, stills uh, tripod. So it's like a, it's cool. perfect for doing what I do, which is this fusion of stills and video together. Um, it's not available yet. I'm not sure when... Uh, it will start shipping, but uh, so it's only on pre-order. Uh, I don't even know if you can find it much if you search online yet, because I didn't. There wasn't much that came up. It's just that that program, uh, that company I'm dealing with here in Melbourne has a pre-release copy, and it's on uh, pre-order through them. But obviously, it, you know, it's Vanguard, so it'll, it'll appear everywhere shortly. But I loved it. It had so many little features that you could use, and I'm not being paid to say it. Uh, like I said, it's... Uh, just totally, I, I say it or review it as I see it, uh, and it's fantastic. You know, it gets down incredibly low on the ground, like really low, almost touching the ground, um, which is great because I like to use slider shots that I can um, stick a slider on and then reveal a bride walking in and, and sort of looking at a dress and things like that. And often I can't get the uh, tripod down low enough. So for that, it's, it's just brilliant. It really is. Um, well, one but, thing, like... You know, like the Manfrotto, it doesn't get too low. So what I always end up having to do on other tripods is actually put it upside down like this with the camera upside down and all that type yep. of stuff and then flip the video later. Um, I did a couple – I did a martial art uh, commercial, and we had all these guys lining up like in a row, and the, the master was like doing his little thing through them, and I was on the outside of them like down by their feet, and we just put, put it kind of like this – but we had to put, you know, slider wasn't long enough, so we had to mm. put this on a dolly track. But yeah, I want to. I would like to find something that's more heavy duty that gets low, like you're talking about. Well, it, the the center column uh, reverses so that you can hang it upside down. Yeah, that's uh, cool. which is really good. But then it completely comes out, and it just has this tiny attachment that you sit on the top that then just sits in, screwed into your uh, camera, and then it's almost like I said, touching the ground. So. It, it, it's a brilliant system. You can pan with it uh, and everything, and it's it's really good. I'll, I'll seriously think about getting that when it's available uh, due to the fact that I, I'd, I'd like to just take one tripod, and that seems to be that it, it'll do the job. So so how's your week been anyway? Been pretty good. Uh, just usual, the, the old busy stuff, and since, of course, I'm into the new Fuji gear, just been doing more videos on that and tests and uh, trying different things out, so it's kind of fun. Uh, doing some new stuff there. Uh, well, oh, we did a um, last Sunday. Was it Sunday? Yeah, last Sunday we did a photo walk. Me and my friend and his daughter, and it was it was quite interesting because um, I think I posted the photos. Yeah, I posted the photos, and it was fun because my gosh, it's so relaxing because you don't you know we didn't have to wait to, for anybody to be on time. The the lighting isn't crucial. 
Um, you don't have to direct anybody on where to stand or how to stand. So it was really just, I haven't did that in years, just walked around taking pictures of interesting broken up stuff. So it was kind of cool. So we did that, then uh, edited those, posted those. And I'm going to, I did a video with my, uh, my uh, pocket camera, the, uh, what's it called? The Osmo pocket. And I don't know if it's enough content to make it, but maybe I'll try to start doing a little video like that, but maybe it's boring. I have no idea, but I actually mounted it on the cold shoe. That way, when I'm taking shots, it kind of can see what I'm shooting. And when I turn it this way, I had a little mechanism. To, well, how did it work? Did it work okay doing it that? Yeah, it was pretty good. But the only thing is because, you know, be, I was using a prime lens and so you can't really see the lens in the shot. So I yeah. don't know if that's going to be like, I don't know if that's good. But next time I might use, like I have a magic arm that I can bring it down lower. So there's more of an angle to the lens and it might be a little more interesting, but it was kind of like a, a test. So I'm going to go through the footage probably in a couple of days and see if it's worth doing a video over. Um, and then after the video, I have to ask people, are these videos boring to you guys? Because I don't know if people like those types of videos. No, well, it's been interesting watching your transition from, uh, you know, Sony to Fuji. So that, that's that been really interesting. You seem to be still, you know, really happy with what you've done, which is great. I mean, if, have you found any sort of issues or none at this stage? Not too much. Like right now, um, out of all the lens tests I did, I completely forgot to, I don't even know if I mentioned it in, in my lens test videos, is the 16 to 55 f2.8 lens. That's what I'm on now. Uh, that is a, an amazing lens. Uh, all the videos prior to this, I was using the 16 millimeter f1.4 prime lens, which are known to be a little slower focusing. So this one, uh, I don't know. I don't know when these came out, actually. I'm that new to Fuji. I don't know if this is a newer lens or not, but it focuses so much faster and it's nice to have that 16 millimeter to, well, that's like a 24 to 83 millimeter. So I'm getting more, more, uh, you know, more field of view or more coverage from this system than I did with the Tamron, uh, 28 to 75 on the Sony. Mm -hmm. So I'm actually liking that. And so I have it on autofocus. Now I have it on face detection and, uh, we'll see how it goes. I can't tell on this monitor if it's going in and out wildly, but no, it doesn't seem to be the depth of oh. field uh, is not there like with your other lens. That's the only thing. Yeah, because it's f two point eight. Yeah. But I, in a situation like this, I, does it matter? I, I don't know. You know, um, if I had it my way and I had more space here, I would probably want to put this tripod really far and use like the fifty millimeter equivalent. It would kind of look cool. But I felt like one four was just maybe not enough or quite. So thought I'd put this on. It has better um, autofocus. So your question is, have you had any issues? Uh, no, I really haven't had any issues um, except for the 1.4 lenses being just a little slower than the newer ones like this. But so far, uh, nothing to complain about. Um, well, those then, images that you put up this morning on the photography videography school, um, it, it just shows that when people say you can't get depth of field out of APS-C, uh, it's not true, is it? I mean, that's that's the thing. It's oh, no, not true. that's not true at all. I mean... I was getting paper. Actually, what our, our little photo walk was all about just taking our 35 millimeter F 1.4s, which is the equivalent of a 50 millimeter field of view on full frame and just shooting with that and nothing else in the 50 millimeter, as we all know, you can shoot everything with. And I actually had to stop it down a lot just because it was just so blurry that you couldn't see nothing. I had this one with a stop sign. And then in the back, you could see a church steeple. Well, F 1.4, even on the APSC, it was just a blurry blob back there. So, you know, I had to actually stop it down. So, yeah, that's um, it's it. Man, I'm finding that the Fuji is right in between uh, the APS-C that this Fuji cameras are producing is just not so far behind full frame, but way ahead of my micro four thirds. So I'm feeling pretty good about it, actually. Yeah. All right. Well, I suppose uh, a lot of people are popping in the chat. We've got 28 watching now, which is fantastic. Please, guys. If you can, we'd love a thumbs up. No, we've already got one thumbs down. It's probably a hater that it hates what I'm going to talk about for the first story, Aaron. <laughs> but, you know, I if know. you can, please give us a thumbs up, guys, uh, because it does mean that other people will see uh, this show. Uh, and like I said, we're both not sponsored, so that it's uh, we really appreciate any help that we can get. So um, did you want to pull up the first story, Aaron? And I'm just going to put on the timer up there. Yeah, time let's pull up the starting. first story. And, it was uh, the Canon are at it again. Yeah, exactly. Let me pull that up. Hi, Aaron. Hi, Oreo. Uh, 
Dana, Gerald, hello. I didn't say hi to you guys. I was too busy uh, talking. Altrick, hello. David, Barry, Street, Gerald, who else we got here? Casper, uh, Navik, Carl. We see you all there. Thank you for stopping by. Give us a thumbs up, if you will. That really helps us out. And we're going to share the first story right now. All right, so Can let me we put see that it? in the thing, which is 15. Okay, uh, now Carl, I got I to remember how to... Okay, you can talk now, and I don't think it's just it's go for a uh, preview to all. I think it is. Yeah, I um, got it. Cool. Yeah, is the right thing. So I, I, I mean, I actually put a story up about this, but I wanted to have a discussion with the live group about it um, because it's it's just really interesting, Aaron, and it just makes me laugh when I, I think about what Canon have done. Now, not only have they crippled the uh, the actual flash on this, but they've also, I believed. I believe, have, have also stopped you using 24p, 1080, 24p uh, again, which I, I just don't understand what Canon are doing. I mean, they've taken the centre pin out, uh, support for these. Now, Godox have released this update that lets you um, use uh, their flashes so they're still going to work. Now, how well they'll work, I don't know. But, but the issue is about this is that they're trying to say that this is an entry-level camera. So this is, you know, like the entry level can coming in for a Canon uh, camera, yet they're forcing you to go out and buy Canon um, flashes, which is contradictory because they're saying, yes, you can get the cheapest camera, but you're not going to be able to go and get the cheapest flash that's available. Now, the other thing too that's going to happen here is that they're going to go to workshop the workshops, these people, because they're probably beginners. Uh, they'll go to workshops. And a lot of the workshops do work with generic uh, generic flashes. And that's the problem. So they'll go to a workshop and they're not going to have a flash there that will work with this system. So again, they're hurting their users. They're not giving their users 24p, which is the standard there anyway. I mean, what a Canon thinking. Like we, mm -hmm. we discussed a little bit ago about how Canon are saying they're losing numbers, they're losing sales and things like that. Well, this is a prime example of why Canon are losing sales because they're hurting their own users. Instead of if when times are tight, as a business person, I would try to give my clients more than what they expect, you know, to give them exceed what their expectations are. But Canon seem to be working the complete wrong way and taking it all away from their users. And I don't understand, like, have they got this wish to go broke or or what are they trying to think about? Like trying to save a little bit of money by doing those sort of things. And I can't even believe it's saving money. I think they're just like crippling them and they want them to force users to go up to higher grade cameras. But, you know, I just think they're nuts, Aaron. What do you think? Yeah, exactly. That's like absolutely crazy. And I, and I got you stuck on there, David. I can't, <laughs> I'm going to have to just change manually. Yeah, that's kind of, um, man, when I first saw that, um, that video of that, I uh, forget his name, the, the, I can't remember his name, his video is in the article there. I was just like, wow, that's like just so crazy. But see, I, I've, you know, we, I've been seeing this for years, way back when I got a, what is it, T2i, the Rebel T2i. They would, they would always come with all these just very minor incremental type updates, like almost no updates at all. And some of those, uh, even Casey at the Camera Conspiracy would point out that they would actually seem to look almost as if they put old technology in a new camera. You know, it's so weird. And then they just do this. This is like so absolutely crazy that you would take a center pin out when no other manufacturer would do that. I mean, that is just, my gosh. I mean, if they're hurting, they're <laughs> they're really going to hurt. I can't believe they wouldn't ever think that this won't get out and people won't talk about it. I know, it's just great. Like Gerald made me laugh because Gerald said in the comments that he shared uh, what was Canon thinking video uh, uh, in a forum and the Canon fanboys were calling me all sorts of names. And this is the funny thing about it. Like if, and if Sony did this, I'd also be calling Sony out on this. And this is what I find very interesting that the fact that yes, I do love Sony, but and I am a bit of a fanboy, but if Sony does the wrong thing, I'd call them out. And if Sony had done that, I'm telling you that I would be calling them out big time uh, on YouTube. So, you know, the people that are calling me names on these forums, you just laugh because, I mean, are those people in those forums just blind to what's going on? And uh, it clearly is crippling a camera for no need. There's no need to take out 
the center pin and force their users to buy a deer flash. That is just a silly marketing move. You know, it, it'd be like buying a car and then someone saying, you have to buy the wheels from us and not give you the ability to buy tires from anyone else. Yeah. And people would go nuts if that was the case. And this is exactly what Canon are doing. And I, I just don't understand their thinking. Yes, I, I mean, and I don't want this to sound like it's a Sony fanboy thing because it's not. Because like I said, if Sony had done this, I'd also be uh, blasting Sony and saying they've done the wrong thing as well. They have to be called out for being silly. They should be trying to push their marketplace and stop people from getting angry and moving away. And their marketing people seriously need to look at what's going on. Yeah, it's, it, it's like over the top incredible that they're, the word is out that they're crippling cameras and then they do something as simple but devastating as that. Um, I mean, is there any cameras in the past 10 years that took out the center pin? Because when I would, when I would switch cameras and all that stuff, I would, ha I would have old flashes that would just work on all of my systems, just as you know, like a dumb flash. And mm. that was great. And now all of a sudden, you can't do it with this one. You have to buy the can. It's just crazy. Hey, before like we I go, said, these before we go, people, hey, look, oh, sorry, Aaron. Real quick. I was just going to say, I have you to go ahead. This. Yeah, I, I got I to gotta say, Disneyland in, um, in Paris, we're drinking this today. And we're not drinking coffee. We're drinking water. I had to throw that out before I forgot. And we're just going to sit over there. Go ahead, David. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was going to say that. Uh, the problem is that, like I said, the beginning cameras like what they've got there is something, like I said, a beginning photographer may purchase. And they're going to do workshops. Those workshops have often they have these flashes that are, that are the dumb flashes because they have to sort of cater for the Nikon users, the Canon users, the Sony right. users and everyone else. So the poor things are going to go to these workshops and they're not going to work. And, and this is the problem that's going to happen with the, what Canon have done to their users there. And it, it's stupid. And I, I just don't I just don't understand it. I really do not understand why a manufacturer would do that. And uh, I don't know. I mean, I no, just really yeah. think they, you know, look after their users instead of, uh, you know, removing things. Yeah, it's terrible. It's really bad. Now, what are the Canon people saying? Are there like good – man, it's getting hot in here. Are there good um, like arguments for this? Like what – does anybody know, like, what's the good argument that Canon people are saying? Well, there can't be any good. I mean, Aaron, I just like Aaron said, they'll remove the shutter button, Canon app <laughs> shutter soon. Altrick that's saying, I'll be. That's um, next. Oreo said, Canon has become a joke. It's so sad for me, a former Canon user. They make camera conspiracies, impersonation of Canon's business meetings appear credible. And, you know, and I, I would love <laughs> it so because true. if if Casey got his. He probably won't because that camera won't interest him, but that would be the most amazing boardroom meeting, one that he could do, uh, because it's just so silly. And I, I I mean, the amount of money that they're saving, and even to take out 24p, Aaron, I mean, seriously, who takes out 24 and they did that in the RP, I think, as well. But who takes out 24p when that's the industry standard for shooting video? I mean, why would you do that? Yeah, I didn't even mention that part. I mean, do I need to? <laughs> Is this yeah, like, well, I mean, why? <laughs> I mean, 24p. You know, when I first got into video, it was 11 years ago. And like right around that time, Panasonic just came out with a, do you remember those Panasonic prosumer? They call them prosumer camcorders. They're really professional, but they call them prosumer just, I guess, because they're a little smaller. Mm. And, uh, you know, they had the SLR inputs and all that stuff on it. So it was very professional. And I remember right, right when I started, I got one of those for the church. They asked me to research and all this stuff for a video camera. And right at that time, 24P just came into that Panasonic camera. And it was the biggest, you know, biggest deal to have 24P. And ever since then, every camera had 24P. And now they take it out. It, it's just unbelievable. I, I don't even want to talk about it anymore. <laughs> yeah, it just doesn't make sense. And like, and it's interesting when Gerald said they were calling me names in that thing. I mean, this is probably the problem that the users that are in those forums are just don't care what Canon do, they're just going to let them do it and defend them. And it's it's crazy. They really should be calling them out, you know, and saying this isn't good enough. It's it's but obviously it's not happening. But, you know, anyway, it's uh, interesting. I, I think it's you know, what's becoming now is just going to be fun to see what their next camera comes out just to see what they're taking out. So I oh, know I'm excited oh, no. for the next Canon release because I want to see what they take out of it. 
So that's all we're going to discuss on that one. So uh, we've got the next story. Aaron. I'm going to share it right uh, let me now. Up the time 19. So it's 20. Okay, I think we're sharing. Yeah, now I have to. I always forget to click on this thing. Okay. 20, zero, zero. And now I got to click all this stuff. Uh, righty then. So this is really interesting. I saw this this morning and I thought, yeah. wow, I'd love this thing. It, it, it looks like you could have some really great creative uh, shots with this uh, micro fogger. I mean, I, I do use the cans of, uh, it's like an aerosol smoke that you can use. And I also use the ones you light as well. But this gives you a lovely, interesting look of like, it's like cigarette burning or something like that, that, you know, is really interesting. Uh, can you scroll down there, Aaron, or does it? Whoops, I, I lost it. Oh, there it is. Oh, hang on. No, it's not. There it is. Uh, no, okay. next one. There it is. Yeah. <laughs> there it is. Yep. So it, it's just this tiny little unit there that you see, and it gives you this beautiful smoke that comes out of it uh, like that. So it looks like it'd be gorgeous for doing um, still images and all, even some video and stuff like that. Like if you were doing that film noir type images, it, it would look amazing, I think. It's almost like a when you see the smokers using the vaporizer. I don't yeah. know whether it's a similar I technology think that's in there. Um, but it, it looks really good. There's videos like we'll put these links down below later. You can see there how beautiful the, the, the smoke looks coming out of it. And I can see pertinently, uh, personally some artistic things that I could probably do with this. Absolutely. Uh, but it, it's amazing. Have you ever seen these before, Aaron? No, but I always wanted to get one of those um, electronic, whatever they call them now, the electronic cigarette things. And because you can, yeah, vaporize it because you can modify those to put out a lot of smoke. And I think that's all this is, is a modified one. Now with those, you have to like, you know, inhale or blow out or something with this, I guess what it's just battery operated to do that. I, I didn't get to read the whole article. Yeah, so it I don't must know be, how it, it doesn't say it yeah. must have a battery in it. So it's uh, taken uh, care of you, you know, doing the sucking or the blowing. Mm -hmm. So there's probably some type of fan in there uh, taken. Cause that's all that is. That looks like a modified, uh, uh, vaporizer basically so it's probably bigger like that because it has a fan in it uh, yep. and something else that it it will do that but you can see there it does it looks like it comes out really quite um quite strong there i think they're 80 euro uh, you can purchase these now i noticed down the bottom uh, it says it's 45 minutes continuously um yeah. th that's amazing i mean i look i'm really tempted to get one to have a play around with it because i think it's uh fantastic charges Aaron USB. says um, use a Hoko pop with that, but then Aaron said, depends on the wattage and how much is being vaporized, um, as well coming out of them. So have you used one of these Aaron or have you just no, seen but one? I always no, wanted no, to this get is the one. other Aaron in the oh, chat. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Well, for me, like we, we did, um, when I would do smoke, I would use one of those bigger, uh, fog machines. Now we, I got a really cheap one. And we tried to use it for a sci-fi short film, and it just didn't work. So it was kind of a bummer. You had to plug it in, and we were out in the middle of a warehouse, an abandoned warehouse. So we had it. We needed a generator. We needed all this stuff. And then, so what I ended up doing on the next couple of shoots is just making my own um, little. Uh, you could put some ingredients together to make these little like look. They look like little pancakes, and you just light them on fire, and they produce all this smoke. You can go to my YouTube channel and check out the uh, clandestine behind the scenes and see all that. Um, but like this would have worked perfect for the intro where you see the main character, uh, just at his desk working on this little device. This would have been absolutely easy and perfect just to smoke up the, the, the area that I needed. And yeah, I would love to have something like that. Yeah, it's cool. And I think it said down the bottom, just scroll down to the bottom of that page. Cause I think it was 80 euro. I think, uh, it tells you where you can also, buy it from Let's i think see. as well did i go too far Let's yeah go i think you've gone too far before these photos uh, where was it it was there anyway yeah. somewhere i'm sure i read it this morning somewhere that it was 80 dollars uh, 80 euro i think i'm not sure anyway it's there we'll check later but uh, yeah i think it was 80 euro uh it can be ordered now and there's a link there's a uh, i think you can click on the link to purchase that as well so anyway interesting um let us know what you think about that but i certainly would be interested in it uh, because it's, like I said, I've got the fog machine as well, and I've also got the uh, fogging cans, and also uh, I buy the smoke uh, that you light with a um, a lighter, and then that lets off smoke as well. But but the beauty of this one particularly is it looks like you can really control the, the amount that comes out and hide it in little places and, and things like that, which would be fantastic. Like I said, if you had that sort of, is it called film noir, where it was the black and white 
yeah um images that would be brilliant for that type of thing you know where they always had the cigarettes and they they're puffing that big bit of smoke coming out i think it'd look amazing well what we also do in video is we use like smoke machines to just bring a little ambient uh to the scene where um a lot of times we'll we'll, we'll you know blow the smoke out and then we'll just wait till it dissipates to the levels that we want because sometimes you don't want to see like there's smoke in a house but you want it just to have like some lights in the back just to have a little bit of a haze and texture in the air and i mean if you really wanted to you could probably buy a few of these and like you said they're small enough you could hide it in different parts of uh of a scene or whatever and then just have them you know because like if you're filming like this we could put one back there one over here and maybe one right here just to get an even fill and then just let it settle down. And what did it say? 45 minutes continuous? I mean, yeah. that, those are cool. Really cool. I'm glad you found I noticed, that. I noticed Langston also said, holy crap, fog machines use a lot of wattage. Yeah, I had to buy a, uh, I think it was a 2,000 watt generator so I could use that fog machine outdoors. Because uh, they do, they drain a lot of power, those fog machines, when they got to heat up. Yeah, that's probably why mine didn't work. Because I was running off of a, for that sci-fi short film, I was running off of a generator that was really old and clunky that someone let me borrow and it probably just that generator probably wasn't enough to do the lights that we were using and the smog machine because it just wasn't working so this is really cool it'd be very nice to have that all right so the next story uh, let me just put the time in which is the lens filters uh, what are we on 26 30 26 30 mm -hmm. all right we got I, I just lens thought filters I'd share and landscapes. this because it's there's some stunning images on this, Aaron, that you know that they're using with filters to get yeah. uh, the images that they need, and and to get that smooth water type look that you always see in these waterfall shots and things like that. Um, you know, people have to get used to using some of these filters to to slow down the shutter speed. The the secret really is using uh, is to slow down your shutter speed. That that's the main thing that gives you that lovely flowing water type look that you're looking at through here. Um, yeah. And I've really, I do love doing this and I don't do it enough, but I really do love doing it when I get to places where I can use it. Uh, but the images in here particularly were, were just stunning. I thought we'd just sort of share them to uh, show the creative possibilities that you can do. It's also interesting too that you can also use um, these filters to get rid of people even in say in busy city streets yeah. and that during the day like if you use a a very like a 1000 one which is i think it's a 10 stop filter yeah 10 stop. Uh, you can over but you can use that for your long exposure and then people tend to disappear and it looks like cities during daytime are abandoned and that also looks really cool as well uh, that you could do do you do much of this long exposure stuff aaron i do not um i used to do quite a bit of time lapse when i would put video pieces together for just my YouTube video when I go on vacations and stuff. But as far as photography, I never really do the slow stuff. Um, and another thing to point out, I don't know if you mentioned this, but like the photo we're looking at here, um, to get that glass look isn't just like flowing water, but when you, you have waves or little ripples in a water and you do that same technique, you know, those ripples just smooth out and they they just blur out. So it looks like you have a, like this glass, it almost looks like frozen ice. So you kind of get that effect too with these, but no, I, I don't think I've ever did one slow water thing. I did do um, photography, like you just said, where if you slow it down, people are walking by, you, you don't see them no more. So I, I kind of did stuff like that. And I also did like light trails using the same technique, but not with filters for light trails. So yeah, I'm not, I don't really do too much. How about you? Well, I don't do enough. I mean, but I do love doing it. Whenever I go down to the waterfalls down here to the Great Ocean Road, I always tend to uh, use them. Uh, and that's an interesting photo too, because I wanted to talk about that too, was if you scroll down, yeah, that one. There, there are some different types that you can use. You can say grab the typical filter, which is the um, one that's a variable one that you just turn and it, it changes density as you turn it. Yep. Uh, the problem with those is if you go too high up, they, they can cause issues. The one like here is it's universal. that You can just drop that into uh, the filter itself, and you can use that with the really wide lenses that are there that have that bulbous sort of front. They're the only ones that you can sort of use with that. Yeah. The other thing too, some of these filters as well can be variable. So, um, uh, or when I say variable, they can split the horizon. So the bottom part of your landscape won't have the filter 
uh, affecting it, but the sky portion will. Yeah, so you feeds. just line it up with the horizon, yeah. And, you know, that you can get some beautiful results. Now, yes, you can do this on the computer, but I think you get a much nicer result overall doing it in camera and then manipulating a little bit later on rather than trying to do it uh, all on the on the computer when you get home because you can do this these manipulations on the computer. But if you, if you want this beautiful running or, or water that looks like glass or just flowing very smoothly, you know, you just can't beat it. And I thought I'd share that because we'll put this in the link down below so you can have a look at these gorgeous photos. It might give you some idea for inspiration on what you can do uh, if you do use filters. Casper's um, uh, also saying Lee filters are number one. Yeah, they're a very good brand, the Lee filters. Um, but, you know, and you do often get what you pay for. Obviously, the more money usually that you pay for these filters, the better quality you get because they sort of eliminate color casts uh, and things like that, which can... Uh, pop in if you tend to use the cheaper filters. Also, the variable ones, if you push them too far, you end up getting an X sort of cross that that comes uh, across the image because they're like basically two, po they're two polarizers put together. Um, so if you tend to move them too far, it ends up showing this cross that comes right across your image. And you can even see that when you do video, if you use uh, these filters in video as well. So, you know, if you want to get really dark scenarios and do this landscape stuff, you're probably better off to use um, the real not variable filters, you know, that the just the uh, ND sort of uh, 10 or whatever they, they're called, uh, use those sort of filters instead of the variable ones. Yeah, one thing I could add too is um, you could use, uh, if you don't want to use that big, you know, the filter square filter holder on your lens, you can get the, and you don't want to use a variable because of the X factor that you can get and of course light shifts and stuff like that. And because they're polarized, they're two polarizers together, sometimes you get weird uh, like skin tones. I did a video on this a while ago uh, that those can actually kill the skin tone because the sheen on people's skin kind of goes away with those variable ND filters on depending on how the sun's hitting the face. So the other good way to do is just by circular um, strength uh, ND filters like by Hoya. And then you can get those, um, they're like step up rings that are magnet. I think they called them Zoom. I think they sold it to Manfrotto a little while ago. And you screw it on your lens and then you screw one, the other one on your filters and then you just magnet them right on your lens and they just pop on and pop off. So if you don't want to do variable and you don't want to do the holder, that's kind of a good way of doing it. Uh, back in the day, I was using Lee um, filters with square filters and I, uh, I was using the vinyl ones. And I was I did some tests with the vinyl ones with opposed to the glass ones and the vinyl ones looked really good. Uh, I didn't see any. They look just as clear as the glass ones. Uh, however, they're very delicate because they're vinyl. They can scratch easy and, of course, bend and all that. So that's another option if you guys want to venture into this type of uh, photography. Lovely. All right. So next story. Let me just put the time on this one, which is 32. So it's 33. Now this will be this will affect you uh, Americans more than it will certainly affect us Aussies or, or Europeans because I think this is only uh, for the US. Um, Aaron, have you even read about this? Have you heard about this yet? Uh, I saw the article um, earlier today, but I didn't read it, so I'm not too familiar with it. Have you read the article? Maybe you can. Yeah, well, all I sort of saw at this stage is uh, that apparently in the US. Uh, they've changed the rules that they've got to pay state tax or something now or, or GST or whatever it was called on anything they buy, so state sales taxes. So what uh, B&H have done is they've created this credit card that if you uh, get approved on it, that the B&H will refund your um, uh, fees back to you. So, you know, it looks like you're in a, a sort of win-win situation if you're in yeah. the U.S., anyway but it, it definitely appears that it, it's it's only going to be well i suppose you can't get a card from another country if you're from somewhere else anyway but uh, it, it looks like you're going to be able to uh, apply for that card and then uh, save on all of your um your tax which wow i mean you know I, I wish that would be available to all of us but so i suppose if if you're from the us it might be worthwhile and if you do shop in bnh uh, it might be lucky that you apply or, or it might be worthwhile to apply for this card um, to be able to save paying that tax 
Um, because are they? Do you pay tax now, Aaron, when you buy from B and H at the moment, or is that just going to come I, in? Yeah, I don't remember. I don't. I don't know. I don't. I'm not sure. I'd I'd have to check that, but I don't think so. I mean, if you if you're from any state and you buy from another state, I don't think you get taxed, but I'm, I might be wrong. I, I wouldn't know, but this is kind of cool. I mean, I wouldn't get this because I don't need any credit in my life and I don't buy that much, but this is absolutely cool. And what, they're, they're, what is their nemesis called? I guess they're, uh, what's that? Adorama. So this is going to be just like another, kind of another push to, for people to come over here other than Adorama. I think that's how you say it. It's another big camera store. So this is pretty... This is going to take B&H to even uh, a next level as far as people wanting to buy from camera stores. It's going to grab a lot of people. Yeah, I mean, I'd certainly – look, if, if this was available here, I mean, I certainly would get it if, if that was brought through somewhere through here. I mean, I, I'm, I'm pretty smart with how I use my credit card. I'll always pay it off with that month. So after that month, I'll make sure I pay it off so I don't pay interest. So it wouldn't bother me using that at all. Uh, I, I would just use the card and then pay it off within that time so you don't pay any interest anyway. But, you know, if you're dealing with a, a large purchase, the, the tax that you pay may be quite a, a you know, a substantial amount that you're going to get back. So it certainly may be worthwhile, Aaron, you know, if you were, as long as you don't fall into that finance trap of, yes, I'll buy it and then don't pay it off. And that's where people end up with with issues. I always... Uh, pay it off within the 30 days. I think I'll get 30 days of interest free. Uh, yeah, if and you're, I can if, make sure it's paid off in that time. Yeah, if you're if you're really responsible for that and you do lots of purchases, then it's it's a no brainer to do that. But uh, I do know a lot of people who say that, and I'm sure you do. But I'm sure uh, I'm sure you pay it. But there's so many people that don't, and they get they get so tempted with something new, and they don't have the cash. They go, ah, I need that, and then they and then it's out of control. So you really have to just know yourself and get it if you really are are good at doing that and paying it off in the 30 days but if you know if you are doing production and you are buying a lot then you have to do that you're going to save so much money oh no i'm just reading michael's comment down here he said i dropped my 135 gm the first day i got it and damaged it laugh out loud it's still usable but the focus barrow is stiff now uh, and I broke his small HD focus ND polarizer and it's done. Laugh out loud. I'm good. Oh, no, Michael. That's terrible. Oh, I'd that is devastated. ridiculously terrible. You better go get that card real quick and buy another one, man. On the first day, <laughs> he's 135 GM. <laughs> On the first day. Oh, man. Oh, that's, Michael. Oh, that's, that's terrible. Oh, that's awful. Now, someone made a really interesting comment back here, though. They said, I think it was Langston, said, um, Someone said to him that uh, I'm just trying to find it. Um, someone said to him, "Don't finance gear with debt." Uh, I've always been against that. A professional in the field warned me about it very early on, and I agree. Yep. Look, what you got to be very careful though here. I agree totally with you, Trev. You, you shouldn't do that unless you have to. I mean, there may be times where you've got no option and you have to do that, but you certainly have to be very careful uh, going into debt to finance things. It might be better to say get something that's a little bit older or a little bit cheaper and not, uh, you know, go into real debt because the joy of using that gear will quickly wear off if you're having trouble paying it off, uh, that's for sure. But I can understand sometimes you may just have to do it. Like if you need something to do a certain job or whatever, you may just have to do it. But you've got to be very, very careful if you are financing stuff like that. That's That's for sure. Well, to bring up something, Casper asked him if he had insurance on that, and that's something we, we would like to probably talk about in a, an upcoming uh, show about uh, insurance and gear and uh, those warranties that you, those extended warranties that have drop and spill and all that. So it'd be kind of interesting to know if he had anything like that and what, if he does, uh, does those actually work? Yeah, well, I, mine would pay for that. The, my insurance would cover that. Um, for a new lens, but you know you've still got to pay that. What do they call it? The uh, I don't know. There's always a fee that you pay, and I think it's a few hundred dollars. I think it might be four or five hundred dollars. So it's still going to cost you money um, if you uh, claim on your insurance. I don't think there's many insurance policies out there that will let you claim and not charge you any sort of fee. I don't know if it's like that in the US, but it certainly is here, where you have like a gap or something that you've got to pay. 
up front. Is that the way your insurance has worked, Aaron? Yeah, usually it depends on your insurance, but usually you have to pay that. What is it called? Can someone put in the chat? Yeah. As you were th as you were thinking about it, I was like, I know this, and I yeah, it's just not can't. a gap. It's it's um I can't remember. There's a name for it. Yeah, that you've got to pay that is up front before you can make any claim. Yeah, I can't remember what it is. It's uh, you, whatever it is. Anybody's a deductible. There you go. <laughs> Thanks, Langston. Yeah, it's a deductible that you have to pay. Usually, uh, sometimes you can. Sometimes I see insurance stuff where it says with no deductibles and stuff like that. So, uh, but you know what? It's better probably to if you're going with a good insurance company and they're 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 people of their word and they actually do that. I guess it's best to pay for that than a whole nother you know thousands of dollar year. You know. Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't called deposit though, Aaron. There's something else. No, it's, it's, it's deductible. a different name here, and no, it's a different name here in ah. Australia though. Um, I can't remember what it is. Yeah, here it's a deductible. So yeah. you pay the deductible, and your insurance says you know the deductible is 150 bucks or whatever before they can uh, send you out a new one and all that. Yeah, and sometimes it's interesting. It's usually high enough that it's got to be quite some damage before it's worth paying that. Usually, you know, they they're not silly. They always make sure they'll get something back like I know here it's often you know four or five hundred dollars um so it's yeah it can be a tough thing sometimes yes indeed okay but anyway that's story. available now so if you are in the US uh, and you would like to uh save yourself from paying that state tax um it it may be in no I don't think it's even called down payment Aaron I can't remember what it's called I'll have to look at it later uh next story is shooting this wedding so let me bring up the time um this is cool. Yeah, I, I know like it this. is. What are we, 41, 4126. Now, the interesting thing about this story is that um, I found this uh, looking the other day and I thought I'd love to talk about this because I'll explain why in a minute. But you can see here, and someone may say, oh, my God, these things are so grainy, though, these images and stuff. But that Most may not will. worry some clients. <laughs> They probably will, though, Aaron, if you're a photographer. Yeah. But if, yeah. if Aaron starts scrolling through these images, it, it's interesting to get to sort of look at the images that are here. But I wanted to talk about this from the aspect of how I've been starting to shoot my weddings um, lately. And I think that the thing, too, is 3200 tends to be quite um, dramatic if you're dealing with um, film. Uh, but these images are still lovely when you look at them. They're probably a bit compressed uh, looking through YouTube, but they're still lovely uh, if you look at them through that aspect of it, you know, like moments like this that you're capturing. Uh, and I, I think I've, I've changed my thinking really quite drastically over the last couple of years with shooting weddings that I'm using less and less flash uh, in things like wedding receptions and things like that where these images were all taken. Now, there's a reason why I'm doing that is because I want, and even other areas too, I'm using sort of less flash when I'm going, say, into um, uh, like the bridal getting ready and all that sort of stuff. I do still when we do informal portrait shots, but I'm tending now to try and capture the ambient light that's there. And I find it often gives way more emotion and you're sort of seeing the, the image the way that they're seeing it rather than giving this artificial look to the images. So it's more sort of realistic to what's being seen. So, Absolutely. And I found with the latest cameras, I mean, I can only talk about now Sony, but you might be able to talk about the Fuji, but uh, I found now the latest cameras, I can push the ISO up to ridiculous levels, you know, 6400, and they're still quite clean as long as you expose correctly. And that's the trick to doing this is that you need to be exposing correctly in the beginning because if you underexpose that's where you're going to see the noise come in really badly when you start to push the shadows again in your uh, Lightroom or Photoshop or whatever that's where the noise is it's in the shadows so if you expose correctly and you're spot on with your exposure or even going a little bit over uh, you get you'd be amazed at what you can get away with with shooting natural light and that's what I'm now tending to do is shoot a lot of natural light but also using continuous light and matching the ambient. That's where, like I've said, I've, I love the Profoto B10 because uh, that particularly has that ability to be able to color balance to the light that's already there. Uh, and it, it's, it's really quite powerful and I can make it look like it's matching just the ambient. Uh, and I'm really enjoying shooting that ray rather than firing off flash after flash after flash. And it seems to be the way now that I'm, I'm moving and moving away from doing continuous flash all the time to using more uh, ambient 
type shooting, more uh, continuous type lighting, uh, like I said, with the B10. And then when I'm doing the formals later on, I still use ambient, but then I'm also then, okay, I also then use flash. But I, I thought this was an interesting article because it, it's, it's quite interesting that people are so obsessed with noise. And I think the main thing that you're looking at in these images are their lovely emotion that's being shown in them, you know, that, that, that capturing of that moment. And it's not about the noise or anything. It's about that that moment that's there, uh, the ambient sort of feeling that's in these images. And I think they're lovely to look at, something a little bit different, Aaron. What do you think? Yeah, um, I agree with you. I've shot stuff with just natural light, uh, even on micro four thirds. Uh, they were actually a lot cleaner than these. And um, I would just be cautious that if you do have a portfolio of very, uh, very clean looking type shots, that have you know backlighting, uh, rim lighting, and all that stuff, and then someone hires you, and then you and then you give them this, they might be like, "What?" So maybe take a few, build up a portfolio or something first from each wedding uh, to to present. You know, kind of slowly go into this if you want to go that route. I would love to not use flash. I mean, I don't like to use flash unless I'm trying to build a mood or try to create contrast or shadows when there is none. But usually. Um, at weddings like this shot right here, if I was running around using flash, usually I'm using like a 35 mil ish type lens. And a lot of times if I don't have my assistant, which is my wife holding an off camera flash on a boom or something, and I'm just using it on the camera with like some type of a diffuser of some sort, uh, trying to make it as soft as possible, running around taking shots, this shot right here, her arm would just be completely, you know, white. So this shot would have just been probably ruined because it, you know you're trying to capture that look on that lady's face and then you you flash and this arm is just really bright and you kind of it would just stand out way more than it already is so and the ambience like we said you know trying to balance ambient you know using your shutter speed and iso and then your flash power to try to you know keep the lighting that the bride wanted you know she says oh hey i want purple lights i want uh warm glowing lights and then you're popping off flash everywhere destroying that they're going to be like ah we're all nice and bright here but the background's dark or i don't see the purple or the pink lighting so man yeah i would absolutely want to shoot natural light and i actually i do a lot of times and uh with today's cameras you know, you're, you can do it. And I don't think clients, I've never ever had a client say, Hey, what are you using a micro four thirds on my wedding? That looks terrible. Never one time did they ever say that. So, yep. Yeah. I agree with I you. Mean, I agree with you. Look, there's no way I would submit images like this that, that were that grainy, even though I do think they're quite beautiful looking at them. And I really do like them from that artistic side. And that's the interesting thing. Like if your client had seen these and then they may love them to death and say this is what i want and that's mm -hmm. fine but you're right you wouldn't want to sort of have all these clean images in your portfolio and then give them images like this they'd probably go what the hell has happened but <laughs> you know it's it's an interesting aspect that um but I, like i said you, you digital now particularly uh it's amazing what you can get away with with uh high iso if you expose correctly yeah exactly like um i i put up a photo today doing a test I don't know if I put it on our web page there, but um, it was like a 12, 1,250 ISO. And because I exposed it right, I mean, it looked apps. I couldn't know. I didn't notice any grain at all. And it. it was actually quite amazing. So a lot of these shots, if you're exposing properly, um, I think with today's cameras, they're going to look really good. And I don't think clients would ever even point that out. So, yep. <coughs> Beautiful. All right, cool. Uh, so we're on to show your pick. So did you want to show yours? Sure. Yours, Darren? What are we? Let 48. Me get it up. So it's 50, 49. Yeah, 49. This. So we're going to look at Aaron's um, photo first. Okay. So I, I don't know why I always have to hide that. Okay. So here is a photo of my wife. And this was a very easy shot because we're talking about natural light. Uh, so many people, when I first posted this, they wanted to know, you know, what flash I was using and all this other things. And where do we shoot this? This was just, this was with a Panasonic G85 with a 20 millimeter F1.8 lens, 
which is a 40 millimeter full frame equivalent. And we were just sitting at dinner actually. And as you know, I'm sitting across from her, like you see this photo. And I just, I said, oh my gosh, because she every time she would like move forward while we're talking, this light would hit. And I seen this light back here and it was kind of cool because there um, over to the left was the outside window and this was at nighttime, but there was some blue light from outside coming from somewhere hitting a mirror that her elbow is actually resting on. And then um, the, the, the moral of the story is look at your surroundings and try to just use natural light. Because if I was try if, if I had this idea in my mind and this was a photo shoot to create this shot would be really difficult to get that soft light in the situation, in the position we were in, because there's a wall literally, you know, where her elbow ends here. So to get this light would be really hard. Now, of course, if there was a mirror there, you could try to, you know, try all that, but natural light for me sometimes just works the best. And by just having her look into the mirror, because I saw that light coming, she has, you know, natural rim light here and the lights hitting her face from the mirror. And then you have that blue. And then of course the tungsten background, it has that, you know, though that that blue that yellow blue or orange blue type of um difference in color and yeah so that's basically it it's a natural light photo just using my surrounding and i think we even had to pull the table a little you know toward me to get her to go forward so just use natural light look around and you can find it and like we said this was on a micro four thirds it was low light but because i i actually balanced it you know, uh, exposed it properly, but I just brought it down in post to get it a little bit more moody and you don't see a whole bunch of grain and it looks amazing. And I do prefer natural light whenever I can get it. So that's, that's it. Yeah. I think the highlight on the cheek and stuff like that, there near the eye makes that image. It's, uh, it's beautiful. It gives it that separation from that, that background. It's just that Thank very, you. very small bit of lighting near the eyes. Yeah. Uh, really lifts it. Uh, yep, that I came think. right from that mirror. So I was yeah. like, just look into the mirror, which basically her looking into the mirror was looking into the light, uh, essentially. Yeah. And that same light creates the, all this light on her hair and just got to use your eye. And if, if you don't want to use a flash or you don't have it with you, just say, hey, where can we move? Where can we go and just look around to see where that, that light's coming from? And that's what we the did. Fingers for that are shot. beautiful too, Aaron, there as well. Say that again. The fingers are beautiful as well. Yeah, though, of course, the posing too, you know, you gotta, gotta learn how to pose too. Uh, and, and the composition, uh, you know, if her hand was higher, she might cover this and uh, the bracelets in there. So you know, her bracelet mm. kept falling. And so we kept pushing it up. So yeah, there's a lot of posing going on, uh, of course, and the, the composition, how she's kind of coming through the frame like that as well. Yeah. Okay, so let me stop that. And then you can go ahead and share your screen, David. All right. So let me bring that up application window, this one. Now, has that come up? I think it has. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All right. So this one is uh, of Matisse that I shot recently in a Tuca. Um, I adore this image. It, this was shot with the Sigma 105, and, and this was one image that I really wanted to try shooting at 1.4 to see uh, how the depth of field worked with this lens and the sharpness worked with this lens. And, you know, I was incredibly, <laughs> incredibly impressed with this lens. Like I said, I, I took it back um on monday and i really didn't want to take it back because i yeah. used it that much it's it's certainly a lens that i may buy uh, in the future but um you know you see her the way that i've done this is i've asked her to and it's important the way i've asked her to lean against this fence uh, or this brick wall that you've got to put your weight in but then you ha you'll notice that i've asked her to, to flick her hip the opposite way so in other words you've got to push the hip out uh to the right hand side there that's the critical thing about this, to get that curve into a female body is the main thing that you've got to look at here. And it really is important to do that because if you don't, there would have been no gap between the wall and her and it just wouldn't ha have had the same look about the image. You also notice too that I've got her to tilt her head slightly to the right hand side as well, which gives it a little bit of shape. Her hands, there's a little bit of gap down in the bottom uh, with her elbow between her body and the uh, her body and the elbow there, which has given a gap there. If that was closed there, it would look a completely different image. And again, I'm obsessed with um, the fingers and hands uh, that, you know, it's got to be very, very gentle ballerina type hands that I've asked her to bring in here. This is all natural lighting, so there's no flash used here at all. Uh, this was lit completely from the light that was coming in off the uh, brick walls because this whole sort of um, area was uh, 
this ready color due to it all being this old brick because it's in a really old uh, laneway that that sort of vintage laneway. The other thing I was pretty careful about was I wanted to include the blue uh, boxes that you can see just off uh, off Matisse's shoulder there because that particularly breaks up the redness that you see in the image all over. So it's really important that you get that little bit of uh, blue there, which, you know, takes it away from uh, being completely red. But overall, this is why I laugh when people say that Sony skin colors are no good. I mean, you can't tell me that that the skin color rendering there, which I haven't changed, uh, you can't tell me that the skin color rendering there is not uh, is not just beautiful. And when they talk about Sony Color Science, I just think it's a load of rubbish. Uh, I left a thread there deliberately above her waist. I wanted to see how many people picked that. When I posted this, only one person commented on it. Um, but it was funny because I left it there deliberately to see how many were going, oh, David, you left a thread there and, and only one person did. Um, but I, I love the shot. I think it's beautiful. I think the depth of field is stunning. The lens is dead sharp uh, at 1.4. Uh, and, you know, and as Gerald says, I thought you would never shoot brick walls, uh, but I did. I shot brick walls in this scenario. So, yeah, that was it. And that's, again, using daylight. No flash involved at all. Okay, very, very nice. Uh, oh, I lost the photo if I don't. Now I've got to stop sharing here, don't I? Yeah. No, I think I, I don't know what happened. Oh, yeah. So that's really pretty. Yeah, that's one of the things I see a lot of uh, uh, amateurs do when they're posing. A woman is not leaving the space with the with the, the waist and the the elbows. Like me now, there's a space there. Or they'll put them flat against the wall, and that just creates that mm. uh, kind of like a big block of body there. So, yeah, really cool there. And the curvature of that thread was just absolutely amazing how you the got the curvature amazing. of the thread. I don't know how anybody saw that. So really cool. The other cool thing, I don't know if you said that in the end or I missed that, but you know, a lot of these brick wall shots are overdone because they put too much brick there. So yeah, I like the composition of that. And the that camera, uh, that lens, whoo, that thing really makes photos like that really, really shine with that compression and the the amount of blur you got there. Love the shot. Did what did you say um the natural light? Was it just an open sky to her left? No, it's it's a very it's a very narrow lane. The light's coming directly wow. from the front of her. Yeah, I uh, so that. coming in through the laneway at the at the front. Uh, it's there is open sky there, but it, she wasn't lit from that. She was lit more from the front uh, with that image. Yeah, it was really nice. I was reading chat and I heard you say it and I didn't hear it. And the, the thing is about flash, since we're kind of talking about it, and we both showed natural light. One thing I almost always take with me is like one of these little speed lights, you know, this is the Godox, uh, what is it, V862. Uh, you know, they're so small, you know, you can use these for a lot of things. So even though I might never get it out, I'll take it. And if I want to go even smaller, I use one of these Godox TT350s and I got on purpose, I got the AA battery just because you could pick them up anywhere. And one thing about flash that we didn't talk about is color cast. If you're like taking photos of somebody and you're in a green environment or whatever, and you're getting a lot of green, you could sometimes, you know, get rid of that green uh, in camera by using a flash. Uh, so uh, there's another photo we've seen. You commented on it. It was a while back, David, but it was a beautiful shot. But the girl had black hair and the background was dark and black and there was no separation. So sometimes carrying something, just this little teeny little light thing, you could, and I always bring the little stands that they have, and you could just prop that up somewhere, even on the ground, just to try to get some light like I'm using right now. I'm using a hair light here just to separate. So even if you're a natural light photographer, even just one of these little things could, you know, do a, uh, go a long way. That's for sure. Yeah, and I always carry my uh, strobes just in case if I ever need them. They, they always go with me, even though I... I what I'll often do is when I'm packing for, say, weddings and things like that, I'll, I'll nearly always just use my Profoto B1 now. But I will take the speed lights with me and keep them in the car or whatever in case if I need them for some reason that I can quickly go and get them. So they're always with me on any shoot. Uh, it just might be that I don't carry them around wherever I go. But you just never know when you're going to need uh, some external light source, you know, that, that you can actually use. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I was mainly talking about even if you're just doing like little, uh, I don't know what you call them, love stories or whatever, or you, you know, just walking around with this just doing maybe not even a professional gig and you just want to get, you know, decent 
flashes. I mean, this little thing can fit inside there. And boom, yeah, when I do professional shoots, I, you know, we've seen your behind the uh, videos of your stuff. I have like, well, I'm not gonna get out, but it's quite large bag and I have like a lot of stuff that just sits in the car that's re mostly redundancy and stuff like that. So absolutely, but l lately I just been shooting more natural light, but have all that on hand just in case. Um, I noticed Michael also said with natural light, there's a natural depth. But with artificial lighting, you also have to work uh, for it a bit more to really understand lighting and its direction. That's true, Michael. The other thing too about it is I find, particularly with females, that uh, if you're dealing, like say, with that shot like Matisse, it's always softer if you use natural light. There's just something about, but it's obviously because the softbox is so big that you're dealing with lighting overall is just such a massive softbox. Uh, so it's it's so much bigger, you know. Like if you're using a wall to reflect light, that that becomes a massive soft box, um, and you just can't replicate that with um, flash easily. And that and that's the main difference uh, between the two. And that's why sometimes I just love going natural light now. Is due to the softness that you can can get from it. it. It's just beautiful and very very flattering. And you know, it's just something that like we all change our styles and do you know di and do different things. I still love doing flash work. I love it for impact and things like that, and, and my brides love it. But it's to get that um, balance, you know, a, a bit, and like Casper just said that the flash sometimes looks fake and it can if it's overdone. Being a good flash photographer, being extremely good with it, you get people when they'll ask, was their flash used? And that's how you know that someone is an expert at using flash because they, they don't know whether it's had flash or whether it's completely ambient because they balance it perfectly. That one time, I mean, I'll always look at an image and say, I'll know when I need to use it because if the if if Matisse hadn't got catch lights in her eyes, I would add a flash. I would add something that would give her that kick, that little catch light in the eye. And that and that's the thing, because if you don't get that, someone can look dead, in other words. It, there's no life in them. Uh, no life in the eyes because uh, portraiture is always really about what the eyes that 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 catch light you see, Aaron. Yeah, absolutely. That's another thing too I, that I didn't even talk about. This thing here also can leave just a catch light if that's all you're really going for, but without ruining the softness by turning it down, pointing it up, or just having this kind of reflect in someone's eyes. We did that a lot in video too by just using small little uh, fluorescent or LED strips just for the catch light, not necessarily to light their face up. So, hey, David, do you want to talk about our, the, um, our, what do you call that thing? The Facebook page. I got it up yes. right now. <clears throat> Let me just put that. We'd like, uh, we like to advertise this because uh, this is we, such a, an amazing place to go, guys, to, to, well, David will talk about it. He's better at talking about it than me. When you do look <clears throat> for this and you go to Facebook, make sure you put it just like this, photography with that little and logo thing. I, don't, I forget what you call that. Uh, videography school so do it just like this just like you see it in the search engine and you'll find it so go ahead david yeah it's look it's just a site that we've set up aaron as a moderator on here as well so but you can see i've posted right at the top there an image uh it just said we're live we're getting it like i said there's over four i think there's nearly four thousand four hundred people now uh on this site now so it's really starting to grow but it's a site where you can be a videographer you can be a photographer uh I want to open to sort of anyone and we've got a no bullying policy on there. So if people are being bullied, uh, all you have to do is notify a moderator and that person will get one warning after that, they're going to be out because I don't want this to be like most sites that are out there where people are intimidated, particularly females are often intimidated to post yeah. on, on these sites. So uh, this is a no bullying site. It, 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 look, you can critique, but it's often nicer to ask the person if they'd like to uh, to be uh, critiqued and do it in a constructive way rather than just being nasty because there's so much nasty people out there uh, on the internet. So this is very positive. You can post your websites on there. You can post your YouTube videos. Uh, you can do all that sort of stuff on there. The only thing you can't do is post live. Uh, that's the only th restriction that's uh, put on there because we like to control uh, what people are sort of showing. But apart from that, it's it's such a great positive place. Uh, if you join us, you'll notice that people will tell you that it's probably one of the most positive uh, Facebook pages out there yep. due to the fact that they don't, we have this no bullying uh, policy. You know, share your Instagram feeds on there, uh, share your websites, everything. So yeah, please join us. Uh, it's growing very fast uh, and it's just a great positive uh, environment. 
Absolutely. So let's stop uh, this. Yeah, so go over there and do that. And also, while you're watching this, give us some thumbs up. Uh, well, it's live on my channel this time. So give me some thumbs up. Subscribe to my channel. It really helps keep us, us motivated to do this. And next week, it's going to be on David Osler's uh, YouTube channel. So once you subscribe to me, give me a thumbs up. Head on over there after this video. Go subscribe to him so that you'll be notified when our next live video goes next Tuesday at the same time. Now, the next story is, is just our main story, um, which we're just talking about briefly before we open up to Q&A, because um, we're not going to be around too long. We've already been on an hour and six minutes or so. Um, but I just wanted to talk about this, that uh, it's interesting. Instagram, I notice, have just started a um, thing at the moment where they're saying they're going to take likes away. I think they're testing it in Canada at the moment. Uh, and so, in other words, that you're... Uh, followers won't see how many likes a page has got or an image has got. Now, in a lot of ways, this is great news for uh, beginning photographers because they can compete on a level playing ground with the big players out there because people all of a sudden aren't going to see um, that uh, one image has got 10,000 likes and then they get depressed because their image might have five. Uh, and often it, it causes false likes because because uh, things get momentum, then other people feel sometimes like they have to like it and, and it just keeps growing. I think this is going to be a great thing by uh, Instagram. I think it is going to make the, it, it a level playing field, and I hope it does. Like I said, I know they're testing it in Canada at the moment or about to test it in Canada. Uh, I'm hoping it does go worldwide uh, just for the fact that, uh, you know, that you can – there's no point then buying likes, for instance, which a lot of these people are doing. Um, because it's not going to be worth any money doing it because it's not going to show. You'll still see your likes, but no one else will out there. And that's a great feature, I think, that's fantastic. Um, on another aspect of it, though, I just wanted to say that now I'm pushing Instagram quite hard and I'm finding I get more work often off Instagram than I am now on Facebook. I think uh, the younger generation particularly are, are using Facebook, uh, are using Instagram way more than what they're using uh, Facebook. And it's an interesting thing that Instagram is seeming to be taking off. Uh, Facebook is, is sort of not being as popular. It's, you still need to do it, but it just hasn't got the same growth uh, and getting work that uh, Instagram and the same traction that Instagram has. How are you finding the between the two, Aaron? Are you just getting your work from word of mouth? Are you getting it through Facebook or Instagram, or how are you doing it at the moment? Yeah, most of the time mine is just word of mouth, but it definitely started with Facebook. Uh, just being out there, you know, people get to know me when I do uh, different jobs and work. You know, uh, here in Puerto Rico, there's, you know, I, I'm an American guy, so I stand out more than everybody else. So when I do like events and stuff like that, people just start to know me. So I did a lot of word of mouth. However, Facebook was one of those big things because once you have your stuff on Facebook, since everybody's on Facebook, people would, you know, say, Oh, I know this photographer. And so Facebook was a, a, a big play in my work, but I think word of mouth is probably the most, but helped with, uh, Facebook. When it comes to Instagram, I don't get too much on that, maybe because I don't push it in the right way, or uh, I just feel like on Facebook, a lot of the people who, who follow me or the friends that I follow are all from my area, where it seems like Instagram, I get I got a lot of followers from other countries, other photographers, not necessarily people who are looking for a photographer. So for me, uh, Facebook is still probably the the place to go for that, not Instagram. Um, but you are right; more people, like the younger crowd, has been going on Instagram uh, and kind of leaving Facebook. And maybe just the older generation who got on Facebook don't like change, so they're kind of staying there. That's just what I've seen, where the younger people say, "Hey, I'm going over to Facebook," because um, I see. A lot of people that I used to look at on Facebook aren't there no more. They're over on Instagram, and they're usually the younger demographic. But you do have to do both because it's not just the younger demographic that are wanting photographers. Uh, it's the older people too. So um, I still think it's both viable to do that. Um, so I just have to look into Instagram a little more. As far as those likes are concerned, I don't think uh, I don't think it bothers me if there are if if there is there if there. If the likes are seen or not, um, it does help the people trying to come up where you don't have a bunch of people just liking one and everybody says, oh, that guy only got two likes, even though the work is outstanding. A lot of people 
don't jump on the bandwagon or their their sheep or followers because oh that only got two likes even though it's outstanding. So I think I think it could help people like that. Um, for many years, people have been talking about YouTube. Why don't we get rid of the thumbs down because that does good for nobody? Where if you don't like it, just don't thumb it up. And if you do like it, thumb it up. So the thumbs down on the YouTube is maybe another topic, but. Either way, I think it's going to help people out, and I don't think it's going to hurt anybody that's already producing great work. Because when you like someone or follow them, whatever it's called, on any of these platforms, it's because you like their work. So, yeah, uh, I think it's going to help those uh, people just coming up trying to get on an even uh, playing field, yeah. like you said. But I do both Facebook and Instagram. I think YouTube were talking also about getting rid of the uh, thumbs down as well. Uh, that's that is in talks uh, uh, as well. Uh, that I, I think they probably should get rid of it because it doesn't give you any feedback about about why they're giving you a thumbs down, which is a bit silly. Uh, you just get haters. That's the problem. That will just downvote you before they've even watched the movie. I get it all the time before they've even seen the video. I mean, you know, the video goes for five minutes long and, and 30 seconds after you've posted it, you get three down thumbs. So, you know, it, the, and that's the problem. It's flawed because they, uh, the haters just are there and they'll thumb you down no matter what you post. Um, yeah. Like I said, that. getting the thumbs up, like it, it, it just does nothing for anybody because you can have like, you know, 500 thumbs up and then you could have 200 thumbs down. It really doesn't do anything. Cause, so if you got rid of that and someone wants to say, is that, video worth it or not all you have to do is instead of a thumbs up put it like on it or whatever and then if you see it has a thousand likes like oh that's probably a video i should watch the thumbs down doesn't do anything so i think they should absolutely get rid of the thumbs up and thumbs down thing maybe and just put a like on there and mm. if you like it you can like it if you don't like it then you don't like it and that's it no i mean i've never i've never put a thumbs down on any video i've ever watched if i don't like it i, I just wouldn't watch it so it, yeah it's that's how, that's how i am yeah. too uh, yeah. some people will even go as far as leaving <clears throat> nasty comments i mean like geez just go away if you don't like yeah, it yeah don't watch it uh all right so we're going to do a quick q a um there let me just put the time down on that what is it uh, one, one eleven. Whoops. One. 11 oh, 57. Um, so I had one question here. So far away, if you have any questions, guys, um, we're just going to do five minutes of this, so we won't be too long. Uh, Andre says, David, if you had to choose from the 85 Badis and the 135 GM, which would it be? Well, Andre, at this stage, the interesting thing, you're going to laugh, but I haven't even used it yet. It's still sitting here, and I haven't. I, I tried to do a shoot on Saturday. We drove to Melbourne. Uh, to do it. I organized with Matisse, but unfortunately Matisse canceled at the last minute. Um, so we, we couldn't do the shoot. So I'm still, I'll be using it sometime this week in a shoot. Uh, so I'll be uh, testing it. I've also got the uh, Sigma 135 mil as well, the Canon version. So I'm going to be testing that uh, as well uh, in the coming days. So stay tuned for both of those. But uh, it's hard to say. I think you need both, Andre, because 85 millimeter gives you the ability to shoot a full body if you need to without going back too far. The 135, you can't do that. Uh, if you've got the room, I think the 135 is the perfect focal length uh, for portraits. It is the perfect focal length, I think. Uh, but you certainly need room to do full body with it. It's great if you're doing head, shoulders, uh, that sort of lineup, you can get fairly close <clears throat> and do beautiful uh, images with great compression in the background. So I, I think uh, there's no way I'd probably get rid of my 85. Uh, I'd keep the, I'd keep an 85 always and have the uh, 135 uh, as well. So I will be using both. Uh, I, I mean, 85 is universal. What do you think, Aaron? Yeah, 85 is really good. Um, I love compression. Uh, that's for sure. However, having an 85 is like the sweet sweet spot because you can just have more room. And I always like to have a fast 50, the fast 85, and then a longer one for that compression. And just how much of the view, how much of the of the surroundings do I want to see, or how much compression do I want, and how much space do I have? All those things come together. So having those three lenses I think are better. Now, if you were to choose one lens and you're predominantly going to do portrait, again, the 85 full frame equivalent would definitely be the best because you're going to be able to use it more in more cases than you would a longer lens. So that's how I feel about those. 
Uh, Langston said thumbs down does help in some cases because they're saying in here that Scott also said the down vote still counts as engagement so it doesn't really hurt you and it does and that's why I laugh when they give them to me because it still counts uh, as engagement. I, I just think they should get rid of it because it's it's, it's just not useful really uh, at all. Well, um, someone said also like uh, then you know if it's a bad video but you would know it's a bad video by it not having any likes. So if there was only likes and you're going through it's like that video has no likes it's either brand new just uploaded or it's not worth watching because everybody else that went and seen it just didn't give it a like so don't need the thumbs down at all and i think it just fuels the haters but if they left it i, I don't care and it's good for engagement so so be it uh, michael said the sharpness of the 135 gm reminds me of the sharpness of the 51.4 the best of me yeah it is it's incredibly sharp even just in my quick testing uh, it, it it really is sharp. And you know what? The, when I did the testing of the 105 too, I, I think all of those lenses now are incredibly sharp. That I'm, and I'm sure I'll probably find the Sigma 135 is equally as sharp as those lenses or very, very close that the average user probably would never tell. I think the big difference is going to be obviously the focusing and stuff like that is, is going to be the big difference between uh them but but stay tuned and I'll, I'll let you know when i um review that as well casper said thumbs down to all fuji users <laughs> uh and uh what's that's about it guys i think that's basically it for today well, someone mentioned real quick uh, i wanted to get this someone mentioned about using a flash to get rid of color cast like in a green a park or wooded area and this is one of those cases where i think it was langston that said an led panel might work good for that and you're right if you got a big enough led panel with a diffuser on it so you don't see the little point lights and you're not getting weird reflections like the ice light that david uses that might be really good if you can get it close enough i guess in a portrait situation to get rid of the green or whatever color cast is going on in the scene so that's a good point very good point Beautiful. All right. So uh, what have you got coming up, Aaron, this week? Uh, not too much. Just more videos to put up about the Fuji lenses. I've got uh, a couple more things to try out and might be trying out a new camera as well. So stay tuned for that. I'm going to be getting uh, there's so much to do. You know, I mean, there's more photography stuff I have to do. I'm going to be testing this. Uh, how did the lens? Was it was it going in yeah, and out? Same fine. Same yeah. Fine. So that's the eight. That's the 16 to 55 f 2.8, and I did not try that one yet. So apparently it's working pretty good, better than the 1.4 primes. But I'm going to be delving more into video as far as uh, color grading codecs. I want to do a green screen um, with the higher bit depths to see, or megabits or whatever you call those, to see if there's less artifacting than my other cameras I had. So, yeah, a lot more video type centric things to come on the fuji what about you anything Beautiful. coming up uh yeah well i've got uh, like i said i posted that video this morning check that out if you want to see the vanguard video that i posted an amazing tripod uh and that's up for pre-order well it is in australia now it, it hopefully it'll be elsewhere very very soon so check that out if you haven't looked at that i've got my final review of the 105 uh still to come that probably uh will be tomorrow so i'm going to put up my final thoughts about that lens uh that that'll be up sometime tomorrow i would say and then obviously friday or thursday your time in the us and europe i've got my usual sony uh news and rumors uh show coming up as well so stay tuned for those and that'll be on the normal time about this time this show started uh today on thursday for you guys in the us uh, friday in australia so apart from that i'm just going to go out now and get a coffee because uh, it's coffee time for me you guys will all be going to bed soon but i'm uh, like i said our day is just beginning so it's been fantastic guys uh, don't forget any comments leave them down below um as well give Thar uh, aaron a big thumbs up and let's get him up to that uh, 10 000 subscribers. yeah i'm He's getting very close few to go i'm getting close getting close getting excited thanks guys thanks for standing uh sticking by here and watching our stuff and next week david osler's channel we'll see you there talk to you later guys thanks bye See you, everyone.